Actually, what else do we do? Do a lot of public speaking, such as reaching out to you folks now. Our mission was to not only become good beekeepers, but good stewards of beekeeping in general. And a lot of that involves giving back to folks like you and to our community. We do about 15 to 20 field trips every single year to our facilities where kids load up on you know, there's nothing more terrifying than two yellow school buses showing up <laughs> with graders because they can come up with some pretty interesting questions. So anyway, that's a little bit about who I am. Um, what I'm going to share with you today is is something, some of the things that we've learned as time went on as we were trying to get to certain places and the things that we learned as we went there. I guess the first question you need to ask yourself is who you are as a beekeeper. You know, we, we made a commitment back in 2012 to be there. And we knew that going right in, that's what we wanted to do. Our honey room, our extraction room, was built, completely built. We had a 2,400 square foot barn building. I had an exotic ranch. and. When this revelation came to become a beekeeper, we took 800 square feet of that barn and built a honey extraction room and a bottling room. We had all of our equipment in place before our first hive ever went on the ground. So failure was not an option. When you have you know twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth of equipment sitting in a room all brand new and shiny, and you don't even have your first beehive yet, cart before the horse? I don't know. I, I, I do know that once the bees were there, I didn't want to take the time to start constructing a room, putting equipment into it, you know, figuring out how that equipment worked, figuring out logistics of how we're moving supers around in a room because at that point it's kind of already too late. But we're going to talk a little bit about figuring out your plan and, and setting it and executing it and then okay where do things go a little bit different than what you anticipated. There is nothing wrong with being a backyard hobbyist and only wanting to be a backyard small scale beekeeper. Go around, pick up a swarm here or there. You're still keeping bees. One of the reasons why we do 15 to 20 field trips a year, if I can get a thousand kids to come through our operation, and if just one or two of them gains enough interest and fascination in bees, to inspire them to keep bees, whether you know as a 4-H project or something that they do, you know as they grow, they become adults and put a few on the roof. By the way, you want to check with your homeowners. <laughs> beehives are pretty heavy, and if you crash the roof, I don't know, I'm not quite sure that's covered, but it makes you fit. But some people never, never go beyond that stage. And I know there's so many of these conferences that I go to, and it seems like there's guys like me or other people that are trying to push you to do something more than that. You don't need to. But at some point in time, that trigger might kick <laughs> and cause you to you know, become one of these sideline guys who have your full-time job and you're dancing back and forth <coughs> giving up a paycheck or not, and you're not quite ready to do that, so you have amassed 25, 50, maybe 100 hives, but yet you don't have all that support machinery to make life easy for you that the commercial guys invest in. So well, that's my favorite picture of the guy that literally is doing it the hardest way possible. I think that is the hardest stage of beekeeping because as I said, you just don't have the income generation perhaps yet to get yourself to the point where it becomes a whole lot easier. Believe me, when you have trucks and forklifts, everything becomes a whole lot easier. But if you do have some thought in your head, to eventually give up working for the man and, or woman, 
and and looking at pursuing something long term in beekeeping, you'll find that most of the commercial beekeepers today are doing pollination work because of the revenue side of the equation. When you have a thousand hives and you don't have enough rain and you don't produce a honey crop or it's a third of what it was last year, pollination pays for a lot of bills that the honey just isn't. The other challenge that we as beekeepers have today, 70% to 75% of the honey consumed in the U.S. comes from international markets. So now when you put honey in a drum, you're competing as a commodity product against all of the other commodity product that comes in from India, Thailand, Brazil, Brazil, Argentina, Canada, China. And the packers that are out there are only willing to pay a certain price to put honey in a jar. And if you want to sell them honey at $2.53 a pound, when they can get it off the off the dock at a buck seventy a pound, who do you think is going to win? Because you know business is what it is, and unfortunately, you need to find that niche if you're going to be a commercial beekeeper. Where is that point where I can produce honey, satisfy a customer base, but yet not have to give up the farm because of the fact that I have to compete? with the international honey that's coming in the door. So where are you? Is anybody in here a sideliner? And how many highs are y'all running now? About 100. Six, 10? 10. 2? 60. 15? 17. 17? 17. 17. 17. 17. 17. And today you're generating some honey. Uh, Maybe doing some nudes. Anybody raising their own queens? Starting to? Something I want. I'm looking for somebody to raise queens for me. So. <laughs> Spread the word. I just can't seem to find enough days and time to do it all. Yeah. And, and this is this was one of the hardest things for me to grasp when I first started that research and development phase back in 2010. I knew I had to have hives to begin with, so that was kind of a given. So by 2012, you know, I, as I said, we started with 50. The first thought was after the 50 folks went in, should have started with 100. At that point, I felt ready for 100. You know, if, if you get absolutely no beekeeping education and you start with one hive, sometimes that can be too much because you don't have the education to start with. But there are so many things that you can do when you keep bees, right? You can raise queens, you can go out and, and catch swarms or, or do cutouts. That's something that we don't do at all. And believe me, if anyone wants to get out of my call list, you know, first get a permit from TAIS. I could keep you busy all summer long for people that call me, you know, looking for, in fact, I got three today while I was sitting in different sessions. I got bees in my mailbox, I got bees in a water meter, and I got bees in my soffit. So, do pollination work, generate honey, sell nukes, sell candles. By the way, I made a point last night, some of the folks are in this room, that block of wax, <laughs> that 42 pound block of wax, what'd it go for? 200 bucks? 200 bucks, something. something like that? 250. <coughs> At Christmas time, we make one ounce candles. You know, the little tchotchke candles, it looks like a pine cologne or a little scap hive or a little bear or something like that. One ounce. So. There's 16 ounces in a pound, right? There's there's <coughs> no funky math there. We sell we sell those candles for three dollars a piece, <laughs> and we can't make them fast enough because people buy them as stocking stuffers. That's forty-eight dollars a pound for wax. Multiply that by forty-two. 
and somebody just missed a for tremendous business opportunity revenue generator last well, night. You, the <laughs> Sorry? Well, you keep. No, because I have enough wax. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough bodies to make off the little candles I need. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it, it's amazing um, what the products of the hive can do. I guess the challenge for us as beekeepers, you may not want to turn this into a business because sometimes that becomes less fun than what it is today. But we have an addiction and you know we kind of kind of have to feed that addiction. And what feeds that addiction is money perhaps that we're generating off of the addiction to begin with. If you start dipping into the college fund, feed the addiction, that's not a, that's not good in, on the gambling side, it's not, you know, the <laughs> drinking side or anything else. But this is very similar because once you get hooked, it's, it's tough. I mean, there are no 12-step meetings to get out of this. It's <laughs> <laughs> in it. You're, you're done it. You're in it. So one of the challenges that we had was that, okay, I know I want to produce skincare products, I want to produce candles, I want to produce honey, I want to do pollination work, I want to sell nukes, I have to do workshops, because when you're in a business environment as I am, I had to diversify, knowing that it's not always going to rain and produce the bee brush or the persimmon or any of the yopon that I want. So what do I do when, in fact, part of the business needs to be supplemented by something else. Well, luckily for me, you know, I had an aspiring chef that we ended up sending her out to New York, the Culinary Institute. She developed a whole line of skincare products for us. Developed all the recipes, mixed all of her own essential oils to get the scents that she wanted, made soaps, and every break, when she got home from break, you know, school, she was making soap and lotion and cream and lip balms and everything to keep us stocked. <coughs> what do I do now that she's got her big mill job and is 2,000 miles away? Well, we sold a lot of lotion and cream and soap and all that kind of stuff, and now we're making soap at midnight and trying to keep up. But what do you do with your bees if you want to make honey <coughs> and you, because everybody knows you got to have honey, right? Otherwise, it's just what's the sense of doing bees to begin with, either for your own personal consumption or your neighbors know that you're keeping bees in the backyard. You got to give them some honey in order to keep them happy. So when they, you know, your bees go over and sting their dog, you know, they're not calling the cops on you. So you got to produce some, a little bit of honey. But what if you want to start doing splits? Well, you know, you're going to have to do a split. Or in the spring of the following year, your bees are probably going to swarm. <coughs> so, do I do splits for my own self-preservation, or do I do splits to increase to feed the addiction, or do I do splits to sell to generate revenue, or all of the above? So now I've got honey production. I got wax production as a result of extracting honey. Right? You got all that wax capping. You got to do something with. Think of it at three dollars an ounce. Pretty fine. But pollination work and doing queens on your own, all of these start competing for the bees that you have. All of those goals of executing each one of those things are going to take your time as well. If you have too many of those goals and they start to overlap, especially with the use of the bees, things can go wrong very quickly. What I'm going to talk to you about today is how to work some of those overlapping goals without it becoming too stressful for you or your bees. But there's some key timing elements that you got to understand associated with. You know, the easiest thing to do is just add more bees, right? But that requires more money. I, I figured out today, if I was at a thousand hives, and I'm gonna buy a truckload of bees here in a couple of weeks, even if I had that truckload today, I still couldn't fulfill all of the demand for bees that I have. We're pollinating melons out in West Texas, we're pollinating all of California, 
I have more bee yard locations that I have bees for. I can sell every single nuke that I produce in a year. I just need more bees. But more bees means that I have to have more time to manage more bees or more people to manage those bees. But in order to have more people, I have to generate more income from those bees. So you can see what the vicious cycle is all about. Maybe through some of the things that we talked about today, you can look at expanding some of the things that you do without creating all that stress and perhaps maybe by adjusting some of the things that you do, you can get away with doing it without increasing the budget. Can we all agree here that we love bees and keep it Because I think, you know, when I look back at all of the work that we put into this, and, you know, I was an executive for 30 years, and this is by far the hardest I've ever worked in my life. <laughs> Physically, for sure, you know, a lot of sleepless nights over whether or not it was going to rain in time to get to that next bloom or was I going to have to buy another 2,000 pounds of sugar to feed bees. Those are the kind of things that keep me up. But I tell you, every day I go out and work in the bee yards, it's probably one of the best ones that I have that week. So I don't think you can do this unless you love doing it. So if you're looking at being going beyond that three or four hives in the backyard, you got to come to grips with this, that you're doing it perhaps more because that you love it, but if you can do it, love it, and make money from it to perhaps release you from other things that you don't enjoy doing that give you money, then that's where that balance would be great. How do we get there, right? You know, not many of us can do things haphazardly <coughs> and still have success at the end. We, we probably could if a lot of mistakes would be made along the way or a lot of money would be spent. And that's why I say figure out where you want to be because sometimes that will drive the type of equipment that you use as well. You know, if, if you have four hives in the backyard, and you have them all on individual hive stands, what happens when you grow to 50 or 100? But you kept buying hive stands along the way, or you kept buying top feeders along the way. Well, when you put those on trucks, you need pallets. Even if, even if you put them on a trailer, which we'll talk about in, in the second part of the class, you want to reduce or eliminate equipment that you'd have to throw away or recondition and sell later on versus just thinking if that's where I want to be kind of like building a honey room before you even have your first time cart before the horse well maybe or maybe not if I know at some point in time I want to pollinate something I don't know what it is yet but I think I want to pollinate why not just put your hives on pallets I'll tell you when you have four hives on a pallet, you know, we, we work hives from the side, not from the front, right? We have a hive, a hive, and then a hive and a hive. It's very easy to work hives when they're right next to each other versus if I had four hives stretched over on a four by four, which I see a lot, you can work this hive real easy from the side. What do you do when you get to that hive? Or the other one. Now, you, now you're doing one of these things. What does that feel like on your back if you had 20 hives by the time you got to hive number 20? If you put those 20 hives on five pallets, wow, you'd be amazed at how much easier beekeeping just got. And what did you lose? Well, all the books tell me I have to have all of my hives facing southeast. <laughs> right, don't they? Right. Into the prevailing wind. Commercial beekeepers that run 10,000 hives, 1,000 hives, 200 hives, that's probably more, uh, I got bees in the tree. Two of those hives are always going to get the shaft, right? Because you can only point two of the hives on a four frame or a four hive pallet into the wind direction that you think is the right direction. 
it can be done. You don't have to put them all in the and believe me, they still survive. Oddly <laughs> enough. So go ahead and start thinking about maybe putting those hives on pallets. And the nice thing about having those two hives right across, when you take the lid off, you have some place to set it. You don't have to put it on the ground, which means you don't have to bend over constantly picking up boxes and frames because you got a whole shelf right in front of you. You just top through your ball and put that right on top of the, you know. So I have learned in my life that there is a difference between trying and committing. <clears throat> what was that? Yoda? Is that that Star Wars thing? <laughs> there is no try, there's two. <clears throat> Commitment is the same thing. If you truly commit to doing something, nothing, nothing will prevent you from accomplishing it. And I know I used to tell this to my daughters when they were, from the time they were this high. And they're both successful young ladies today. Now, the difference is when it doesn't go as planned, do you give up? We take what we learn, and I say to myself, am I truly committed to doing this? And if the answer to that is yes, what's possible given what I know now? Result. I'm not sure I like that result or it didn't work as I planned it. Instead of crying and taking my toys and going home, I said, all right, now that I know this, what can I drive from this to still accomplish my goal? And that's what commitment is all about. So establish the goal, commit to the goal, figure out a plan. I, I remember the first job I had, my big boy job, going into my boss, and I was a technology person, and we had certain technology systems, and he had certain needs, and I said, I'm going to do this, X, Y, Z. And it was writing this series of financial reports, getting the data out of this archaic system that we had. And I, I had a clue how I was going to do it. But I committed to my boss that I was going to do it. I didn't have a clue how. I didn't even know it was possible. But I know he had a need. And being, you know, that fresh snot nosed kid out of college, I was gonna make my boss happy. And that's when I first learned about commitment. And I did accomplish it. I learned a lot along the way, but everything can be possible that way. <coughs> Did you ever read the back of that shampoo bottle, lather, rinse, repeat? Did you ever go through a whole bottle of shampoo? When does this ever end? <laughs> I guess when you ran out of shampoo, it was over. Well, when you run out of money, I guess it could be over too. So making you know, smart choices to begin with and educating yourself during that planning process and that execution phase you're going to allow the rinse repeat a few times, but is is least damaging as that can be as possible. And you have a whole community of people around you that can help you. That's one of the nicest things about keeping bees. You're sharing a passion that so many other people also enjoy. And most of them are willing to share their ideas and concepts. and. You know, I, I hear Clint talk about things that I'm saying, wow, what a great man to be standing up and telling what others would be afraid to share. Competitive secrets, perhaps. And he's telling the world. But that's the kind of people we are as beekeepers. We teach two workshops at least every single year. And 22 hours, 24 hours of beekeeping education, hands-on, half hands-on, half classroom style. If all of the, the people that attend our workshops could take away these four things, they could be very successful beekeepers, but they are must, must 
do's or must haves or must knows associated with, with our success. You have to understand the biology of the insect, period. In our workshop, we do four hours on biology. And it's not looking at vein patterns and wings. It's about biology and behavior associated with the insect as you are going to go through managing them. And with that comes BMAT. Did anyone see Dewey's um, session the other day on BMAT? There's so much that you can immediately tell is happening or will happen within days or weeks or 21 days or 23 days or 16 days from what you are picturing exactly in that hive today or what happened at least a week, two weeks ago. If you understand the biology and the math associated with this simple creature, who is very complex by the way, <laughs> managing bees can become a whole lot easier. If you don't have a firm foundation there, then go back and, and go through that process. Do y'all have wax moss? Y'all have varroa mites? Y'all have hive beetles? What, what causes hive beetles and wax moths? Weak population. Weak, weak population? What can cause weak population? Nutrition, poor nutrition. Poor nutrition, poor nutrition and varroa mites. You know, you see how these things all work together? Has anyone seen chalk root before in their hives? Chalk root? I call it the athlete's foot of beehives. Because it's a, it's a fungus kind of thing. And a little chalky mummy. You actually like, sorry, dried bird poop. You get these little dried bee mummies on the bottom of your bottom board. That's chalk root. Understand what it looks like so when you see those little white things, you know they're not just dried up larvae which they are, but understand why they got there. Y'all seen European fowl brood before? No? Yes, so you have? Understand that if you don't solve some of these problems and you have multiple hives, bees drift, okay? And it may be in this hive today, in a week it might be in both. If you can't spot those diseases and know how to solve them or change the direction of that course, you literally could use, lose many of your hives. The same thing with varroa mites. I go into a yard that has 24 to 40 hives, depending on my yards and my yard locations. And we'll do a mite test. We do alcohol wash. And I'll test one hive and, hey, great, it's got one mite. Do I leave the yard? So I don't need a treat. Now as a commercial beekeeper, do you think I have time to test all 24? Knowing that I have 10 more yards to get to that day? No. I test one, if it's only got one or zero, I go test another one. A little ways away. If it's only got one or zero, now I'm feeling really good about myself as a beekeeper. Do I stop there? No, I'll go to a third out of the 24 and say, does that one, oh, we got three. Three's no good for me. What do I do? I, do I just treat that, that particular hive? No, I treat the whole yard. When you get to numbers in beekeeping, you like, we have to keep everything as even as possible across all our hives. If I have a few weak hives and some really strong hives, <coughs> I'll give resources from the really strong to the weaker ones to equal them out. And I'll only do that twice. And if that weak one, assuming it doesn't have disease or a mite problem, if the queen doesn't pick up, maybe she didn't have enough nurse bees when we first created the split or whatever, if that hive doesn't eventually pick up, sorry, it's no longer a hive. You know, we amalgamate the resources into, into something else. So we try and keep things even. But understanding those diseases, what causes them, weak hives, guaranteed you're gonna see beetles and wax moss shortly thereafter. 
what are weak hives, ki weak hives caused by? Usually nutrition issues or varroa mite issues. So understanding that. But how do you do that? If you're not out looking at your hives every seven to 10 days, you don't know what's going on. I have had people that go to our class and learn everything they're supposed to learn, call me six months later and say, my hives are dwindling. The first question I ask, what was your last mic count? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you test for mites? Well, no, I didn't see any. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, did you put any mite treatments in? No, because I didn't see any. <laughs> you went to class, you, right? So, there is a difference between being a bee haver and a bee keeper. A bee haver is somebody that has those pretty hives in the backyard and they can tell their neighbors that they have bees because it makes them feel good that they're doing something because everyone hears that the bees are dying and we got to do something to have bees to, you know. If you put them in a box and never check them again, you shouldn't have them to begin with because you didn't have the time to devote to take care of them the way that you should. Everything that you do, yes? Can I ask you a Foolish question. If, if, if you're keeping small amount of hives, yep. why not just treat for roll of ice and skip the testing well, after the honey flows? Just get them anyhow and don't worry about that. I, I test because I want to know the efficacy of the treatment. You never want to treat, well, you, you can, certainly. You can do that, right? But if I'm treating a hive and I don't know if the treatment, because we have this issue with treat, some treatments aren't working very well anymore. Okay, and we're going to talk about treatments, especially I think later on in this this part of the, of the session. And there are some treatments that you can use that I can't use, you know, just because of scale. Or you may be in a different part of the state, like humidity affects certain treatments and how well they work. So I would test before and after so I know either whether or not the treatment worked to begin with. And prophylactic treatment in any way, it, it just, over time it's going to reduce effect your, your efficacy as well. So it's better to test if you don't need to treat than you shouldn't treat. You're kind of wasting your money if you're treating at the wrong time too. Because mites do have a life cycle in your hive, just the way your bees have a life cycle of building up and right. everything that we do I figured out very early on has to do with timing what happens in my county we have this this plant called bee rush or white brush it's a phenomenal plant if I could bottle that the perfume smell that comes up I'd, I'd be a billionaire anyway um, bees can fill a box on a flow in two days I learned that the hard way the first year, and then I ran out of boxes. And now I'm using every box I have in the, in the in the in the container, whether they're deep meant for brood boxes or something. Be prepared. The bees are going to tell you when it's time to do something. It may take you a little while to learn the clues, but if you know next year that that you have five hives today and assuming that all five live, but let's say only three of them live through the winter, what are you gonna do in the spring next year when those, when those build up and they're packed? Now's the time to think about building the boxes, painting them, and set, building the frames that you're gonna to need to do the splits, because if you get to next spring, it, it's already too late. Those bees are gone, you just lost money. Either for bees that you could have grown into your own apiary, nukes that you could have sold, making up for the dead ones that you lost. There is a lot about timing in what we do. Are you all familiar with the calendar of events in your, in your area? Because what happens in South Texas is very different than where I'm at in Central Texas. What happens in East Texas is very different than where I'm at. East Texas is two weeks minimum ahead of where I'm at. I know because I used to go out there and get brood for my hives 
to expand. And he always wanted me to be out there two weeks before. I'm like, Mary, you kidding? It's still freezing cold out here. Be it, I go out there and the trees are already starting to bloom. Same thing in South. Now, out West, it's even different. So understand what happens in your area associated with the ecological cycles, because you'll need to know that. So I know when I should be looking to treat my hives or test my hives for mites, when I need to start preparing for certain plants and honey flows. You know, I went to a, a beekeeping club meeting out in San Angelo. This was back in that 2010 to fall of 2011 when we put bees on the ground in spring of 2012. I remember going out to one of the club meetings out there and they had a plant day, you know, plant meeting, you know, where people brought in different bee plants. And I live on a ranch, I had 500 acres on a ranch. And they're showing up and I said, I've never seen that before. And I'm like, are you sure this? They were showing me hend it. Are you sure it's like all over the place? I, said, I don't think I've ever seen that stuff. Well, I got back at 11 o'clock at night, and sure enough, I got out of the house, and I walked over to the barn, 100 yards. I'm like, this stuff's all over the place. <laughs> you become much more aware, but sometimes people have to point it out to you. So become aware of the calendar of events that occur in your area. I can give you an example, but it might be a month <coughs> off, it might be a week off, or it might be pretty much the same. But bees in general follow a biological cycle, which means your work cycle is going to be similar. Well, my friend out in the east, sorry, mind your way. My friend out in the east might be a little ahead of my work schedule than where I'm at. But as you relate and talk to different beekeepers, just because you know one person is doing X in their hives, if they're halfway across <coughs> the state and you're talking to them. Don't immediately think that you've got to go out and do that to your hive today. Your cycles might be a little different, but knowing that George is putting the mite treatment in might trigger you to think, well, when was the last time I did an alcohol wash? And I keep referring to that method because it is the most scientifically accurate method for testing mites. It might make you feel better to you know, shake powder sugar on them because it doesn't kill the bees, it's not as accurate. And you could get false readings. You could get what we call false positives. You know, because you're, you're not seeing as many mites that are really there because the, the method that you're using to test for them isn't that accurate. You're going to kill 300 bees to do an alcohol wash. You have to put your big boy pants on, big girl skirt. And just, you know, you have to get used to that. You're going to kill 300 to save 30,000. I'm okay with that. And she's going to make more anyway. So, so I talk about bee math and bee biology, especially because we're going to focus this first session on the two things that most people want, and that's honey production and, and doing splits. You know, my little honey drizzle didn't happen on the croissant there. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's probably the different versions of PowerPoint. <laughs> this is what our bees look like when we do summer splits. If you all want to volunteer to come out and help us do that at some point in time, <laughs> I'm more, more than happy to take the help. But there are very <coughs> different things that have to happen when you're focusing on these two things. If you're looking at honey production, what has to be there when that flow starts? Your worker population has to be at its peak, okay? Otherwise, you don't have enough bees to go out and gather all of that nectar for it to become honey. Fortunately, all of the things required to have that worker population be where it needs to be is under your control except for one thing, Mother Nature. Right? You can't control the weather, but you can make sure that you have good queens in your hives. And we're going to talk about queen replacement and split in what I've learned and what 
all the books tell you, which is very different. Mm -hmm. Okay. I talked about making sure that you had enough equipment on hand because there's there's nothing worse than that kick in the gut feeling when your bees are on a flow and they're filling two two boxes, three boxes in a week of honey and you just ran out of boxes. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, 2014. That'll never happen to me again. Is it is it good to have all nurse bees just emerging out of your brood, right? You got you understand the bee math associated with the maturity of the honeybee that just because you have lots of brood in your hive doesn't mean you're ready for that honey flow yet. And I can tell you my first couple years it took me a little bit, the hives look great. Yeah, they look great, they're full of brood, but you don't have enough foragers to go out and get the honey. Why didn't I have enough foragers yet? Well, that's because I was doing splits in the spring. Now what happens when you do splits? Your brood population is what you're looking at to be at its peak. Now everyone tells you your bees are going to get real big in the spring so you need to split them so they don't swarm. If you take a fully populated mature hive and you split it in two, divide up all the brood and the bees, now you say all right, because you're doing this at what, April time frame, May, because you got to wait until the queen breeders get their act together so you can spend 28 bucks, 30 bucks on a bug. To, to put it into your one or two or three hives. Now what happens? Your bees build up on the honey flow. And you got this super sitting on top of your box and you're going, I can smell it, I can see it. Why aren't they putting it into my honey super? Well, because you just split up all the resources between two hives, including all of the four. Well, if I didn't split my hive, they would have swarmed. Possibly, but you know you can manage for that. If you're in your highs every seven to 10 days, you can pull up the frames, you can look for those, you know, where the swarm cells are. They're the ones, the queen cells at the bottom of the frame. What if I just took out one frame of brood and I had a couple of nukes on the side that I keep for sacrificial resources, as I call them, because I keep nukes you know, for weak hives, I add a frame of brood. Well, you can put back, you know, keep a couple of, I, and I tell people when they come to our class, when you're just starting, keep two and a half hives. That half hive is your spare. It's your spare queen when you need one because you accidentally rolled the queen when you did a hive inspection. <laughs> well, put back into those nukes. <coughs> You may not necessarily want to split the hive entirely <coughs> so you can get a honey crop. But all the books tell you, your bees are going to swarm. you got to split your hives in the spring. And some people don't. And what happens is the bees swarm. They may still get a honey crop though because they waited long enough to bring some honey back to the hive. And you notice, of course, you follow that 80% rule. When your boxes are 80% full, you add another box. No? What was that kid's name? What was that movie? No. Anyway, so at what point do you say, I'm going to produce honey or I'm going to produce nukes or I'm going to increase my population of bees? Perhaps you can do both. And really, all you have to do is adjust the timing of one of these events. And that's when you do your splits. Um, I tried this year uh, something I hadn't done before. It worked for really, really well uh, because I listened to Chris Moore on his uh, doing splits by mixing all these. So I have a big hive like that, like you're talking about, rather than just splitting the hive or take one frame out of it, put it in a box, but do that on like four different big hives. Yep. Put them all in the same box. Yep. And then pop some frames in there with them and a queen. And then it gives them more room because you just put another frame in there to replace the one you took out. 
Exactly. Plus you got a <laughs> Exactly. Works really well. We do we do splits very differently than most people do. Nice. But that is certainly one way if you have multiple hives. Just take a little from mm -hmm. every one. Mix. Well, wait a minute. Don't I have to newspaper them together? <laughs> no, you don't. When you're when you're taking frames from multiple different hives, think of it as a gang, right? If you take three frames from this hive and one frame from this hive, who has the power? Three right. to one. Right. Three looks at that and says, you're not part of my team. Right. Attack, okay? Right. If I take one, 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 who's dominant? Nobody. So they all kind of go, huh, you smell different. You look different. <laughs> okay, you got a few chips and uh, keggers in your, your hive over there. Let's all just get together. <coughs> and have that's what happens. Oh, that's so when you take one from each, put them in one, and it's just a free for all, and they still figure it out. They still figure it out. But all the other ones are safe because they're all still dominant. They're just missing something to keep the density. And you're producing it, right? Yeah, that's all. How we do splits? I've had people come and help us do summer splits. They're like, <laughs> breaking the rules. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly right. Yeah, it works. That's perfect. You just use new queen in it, or I just let them produce their own because it's spring. There's lots of bees in the air. There's lots of drones because most of the queens that you get in the spring, excuse me, they suck, and I'll tell you why. So anyway. If in fact you're going to split in the spring, get ready for lower honey production. And I'm telling you, I have found repeatedly that the queens in the spring usually are not good queens. Why? Because you got all these commercial guys out there that are hammering these queen producers when they get back from almonds. They want thousands and thousands of queen cells or they want thousands and thousands of mated queens. Well, the queen breeder only has a window this big between when the weather is okay and when these guys need these queens. Scientific research has proven over and over and over again that a queen, once mated, that stays in that mating new and lays eggs for at least 21 days, ends up being a far better queen. You're in the business of queen production <laughs> You have deadlines to meet. Joe Schmo beekeeper who orders three queens, what's he gonna get? Or she gonna get? <sighs> I just relieved because I set out the last 40,000 queens that I, or cells that I had to get to the commercial guys. Now I still got all these little orders that I have to do. They send you the worst of the worst most times. Is there any queen breeder here? <laughs> and you know what? They can get away with it because if your queen is crappy, you're just a bad new beekeeper. There's something wrong with you, and what are you going to do? You accept the fact that it's probably your fault, you turn around and you buy another queen from them. But it took you two months to figure out the queen was no good because she either didn't stay in the hive long enough laying or wasn't properly mated to begin with. Maybe she only dated two drones versus nine or ten the way she's supposed to. But they had to get the queen out the door or worse yet, they'll ship you a virgin queen and call it a mated queen. You look at it and go, oh, she's beautiful. Nice. You know, then you put it in your hive. Next thing you know, she flies out. You don't know that she flied out until you find her on the underside of your hive because she's got a screen bottom board there. And all of a sudden they're building comb under the hive. Why, why, why did she go outside the hive and go underneath the hive? Well, she went out to mate. And she missed the dang door on the way in, but she smelled the bees, so she went under the hive. And the bees go, oh, why is the queen under there? Well, I don't know, let's go out and build comb for her. It happens, okay? By the time you order that second queen, what's happened? The queen breeder has longer period. The big rush is over. Now they're back to normal speed and they're back to operating normal. They're only taking queens that are 
that have spent 14, or I'm sorry, 21 days in the mating nuke. You ever notice if you wait until May to order a queen or June, you can find them all day long. And they're much better queens. That's why we stopped splitting in the spring. We split now only in the summer. My queen take rate is at like 98%. When it was in the spring, not so good. Not so good. 50, 60% at best. Does so, that matter if you're using, I'm sorry, does that matter if you're using queen cells or going ahead and putting in mated queens? I have not used queen cells. I only have bought mated queens because I'm still looking for that person to come raise queens for me because I got so many other things to do. And there's a high population of Africanized bees in my area. And although I have tons of bees to set up drone yards in the space to do it, I'm not going to do that unless I have somebody there to raise queens for me. But believe me, they're expensive. Made of, buying made of queens. We as a business need somebody to produce queens for us or buy cells. Yep. So what you're saying, what you do is you split you split your hives in the summertime, right? Yep. So that way you still get the honey rush for the spring, but then you get the queens in the summer as well. Yep. The books don't tell you to do that. In fact, everything the books tell you is exactly opposite of that. That we have been very successful doing this. However, it's all about timing, right? I need to get that honey crop in, right? But if I split too late, Queen's already started to reduce the amount of brood that she is producing. Because remember, I want brood populations to be at their maximum when I'm doing splits. If I wait until the end of August to do splits, the Queen's already recognized based on the the resources that are coming into the hive, the volume of pollen has been lowered, the volume of nectar has been lowered, and the queen knows that. I can feed a protein sub and add syrup, but they also know the difference between fake and real. Have you ever seen when, when a pollen bloom happens or a nectar flow happens, <coughs> the queen just goes, absolutely nuts and lays up every single cell in the hive that she can. I can give her as much substitute food. She'll keep producing brood, but it's like an athlete. You know, you, you feed at a certain level to sustain yourself and then you eat like an athlete to, to bust up, right? And prepare. She'll only bust up and prepare on real flows. She'll just maintain on mm -hmm protein, sub, and syrup, at least in my experience. You talk about doing splits in the summer. Yep. East Texas. I'm our in Central flow. Texas. Hmm? I'm in Central Texas. I know. Our honey flow is usually over late June. Yep. Or we start harvesting honey in mid to late June. <laughs> uh, when would you do splits? In your environment? Yeah. Late June, right after you pull honey, bang, split them. Now, there is a challenge with doing it, and this is why in my class, in workshops, this is kind of one of those, if you're a second year beekeeper, I may tell you about this <coughs> and doing this, and this is why this is intermediate beekeeping. <coughs> There's a lot more attention that you have to give to a summer split than you would a spring split. And that's probably why all the books tell beginners to split in the spring. Because it's right. almost foolproof. Anybody can raise a split in the spring. Can they survive? Not everybody. But <laughs> you can make a lot more mistakes splitting a hive in March than you can splitting it at the end of June or the beginning of okay. July. Well, Paul is supposed to and uh, Sugar water make it for yeah. to yes. make it through the winter? Yes. I have hives that I split at the end of July that, are, that started with two frames of brood and two frames of honey pollen that are now double deep hives. Full. Well, I mean, we've only you're, had. You're, you're a lot of money. My hives are 
You have to pay. Yeah, but I did it at the end of July, which means that you would have done it at the beginning of July or end of June. Winter is coming. <laughs> we have to. Well, we, we hit drought right in that period, too. Yeah, yeah. The, the only difference I think that I've seen between Central Texas where I'm at and East and South Texas is when it rains, you flood and I don't. Because <laughs> I don't get as much rain, but I still get some. I live in a creek bottom, so I get a got long. <laughs> Once you do those summer splits in the summer and you requeen your hives with those nice summer queens, she's got time to lay. She overwinters. Overwintered queens are phenomenal. So you get into the spring of the following year, that hive explodes so much faster than a brand new queen does. And you know the nice thing is, you know that the propensity, because you read the books, right? Newer queens have higher levels of QMB, QMP, the queen manipulator pheromone. So the bees know that she's still young and virile. Newer queens, less likely to swarm than older queens. So you don't have as much to worry about in year two associated with splitting that hive because of the fact that your queen is only nine months old at that point. She's still a young bird. So you have longer and she's gonna come out in the spring jamming that hive. So you're ready for that honey flow like you can't believe. So you were telling, you were telling him like when you split in the summertime instead of in the spring, you have to watch them more. Like what do you watch for in particular? Is there anything like any salt hills that you need to keep an eye on for splitting them later? When you're splitting in the summer, you have to be a better beekeeper because there is no pollen, I'm gonna get the very little nectar, unless you live where I do, and you get that bee brush little bloom. After a real good heavy rain, 10 days later, boom, you get a good flow. But not everywhere does that happen, so you have to be prepared to nurse that nuke a lot more than you would have, if you would have done it in the beginning of the spring, because of the fact that you know, you got flowers still blooming and all that. So it, the nuke kind of can take more abuse from you as a negligent beekeeper than that, that, split, <coughs> that summer split. Okay. Now it may, it may cost you a few more bucks in protein sub and syrup, but the idea is to get more honey you know, when the honey flow, your, your hive is not building up on the flow, which is what happens today when you do splits in the spring. It's actually producing on the flow, which means that gives you the extra money you need to make your split later on. Mark, just a quick question. If you, <clears throat> if you don't split in the spring, mm -hmm. um, is your <coughs> technique of avoiding the swarms just to add boxes like crazy, starting like in East Texas, probably late February, roughly. And, and that combined with that, oh, your, first, your first year of not splitting is gonna be rougher. Yeah. Because your queen most likely is gonna be that's older. What I'm, that's what I'm asking. That Get through that first year. Like coming into this spring, I'm thinking I'm gonna try what you're talking about. Get, get those frames that have the swarm cells into a new box. Okay. You know, take the one, if you got four mm -hmm. eyes, just keep them at 90%. And anytime you see that swarm cell, get it out of the hive as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. And the idea is just to keep that hive at full population through your honey production cycle, and then boom, as soon as it's done, split it. Okay. We talked, y'all know what this is? No SEMA? If you, if you have a, a 40 power microscope, most <laughs> high schools have them. Randy Oliver did a lot of research on this years ago and, and sampling rates. And this is what Nosema looks like when you squish bee guts out of those slide. And there's no mistaking it. You know, it's, it, you're not looking for one or two of these. The whole bee gut juice will be filled with that stuff. So 
I don't treat for no SEMA. I try and keep my eyes as healthy as I can. People talk about fumagillin. It was great until we figured out that, yeah, you can treat it and it'll go away, but it'll come back 10 times worse. So I stopped using it as something that we treat hives. And you all know the difference between the two, looking at the two? <laughs> this is the first year I ever encountered hive beetles. Oh my gosh. We, we, I, I, there's somebody here in the room and I shouldn't say this. I have hive locations in Uvalde. Sorry, Jim. Because <laughs> there's this honey that he always bragged about called Wahia. Oh, and every year he comes to the honey show, <laughs> this is what you got to be. <laughs> <laughs> so we took, I, we took hives down to Uvalde. I have a lot of rancher friends down there. Well, never had hive beetles till I went to Uvalde, so you got me back. <laughs> I have, I, you know, those little traps? Mm -hmm. I tried those. Well, I, thankfully, I tried those and those brawny towels at the same time. Those brawny towel things are amazing. They sucked up hive beetles like I've never seen anything before. <laughs> Sorry for anyone who makes those little traps if we didn't catch boo in those things. Mm -hmm. little, little things. So anyway, we all know about our mites. This is my, my mode of operandi here. I test minimally on a quarter to quarter basis, okay? If I find that certain hives are just like, what, what is wrong with this hive? We'll go out and do a spot check on that particular hive for mites. And usually, yep, for some reason it's mite bombs. So you, you, we do something different to, to that particular hive. But you know, we have, we have challenges in Texas with humidity and temperature. So a lot of the fumigate, and by the way, if you use uh, screen bottom boards in college, or because I used to run a crane before I had a forklift, we had to have a bottom board to pick up the hives with the crane. You can't really use a fumigate when you have a screen bottom board, yeah. right? Because and the same thing with the oxalic acid using those vaporizer tools. It doesn't really make sense to do that if you're having screen, but in our area, because of the heat, uh, I would highly recommend the use of screen just for the extra ventilation, but it also limits what you can do for the mite treatment to effect it. There are mite treatments that you all can use that I can't consider using because of the cost of labor. When you have four or ten hives in your backyard or in, in your in your place where you keep them you know you, and you got to go out there three times <clears throat> once every other week or something to, to do a multiple phase treatment that's very easy for you to do when I have to cover you know <coughs> miles and miles of territory throughout our, our county visiting 40 different bee yards three different times you know, you obviously see where the labor gets burned up doing that kind of stuff. So it's come down to two products for me, oxalic acid and uh, the Apivar strips, the Amitraz. But there are times obviously that, that you're not supposed to put mite treatments on because you're collecting honey. So this is basically what, what and about when, you know, we're doing it. Uh, I'll have to say that, you know, we've been using oxalic for quite a while. Maybe you're doing the dribble, though. You're not doing the vapor, right? We're, we don't do vapor. Uh, we do the, we've been doing the dribble method. We were doing scientific research. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some other methods out with, you know, glycerin and shop towels. We've been involved in some research in that regard. <laughs> but you know, there I'm glad to see that people are working towards, you know, getting things legal, but at some point, you know, you have to do what you have to do to keep your business. I'm not telling anyone to break the law. Just maybe do some research. <laughs> you know, I don't use tactic. You know, Tactic is a is an am, is Amitraz that is illegally smuggled into the United States and a lot of commercial beekeepers use it. 
using a shot tunnel. I do not do that. You know, I I can acquire, you know, a 40 pound box of oxalic acid 99.8% pure via certain purveyors on Amazon and I can buy, you know, a 48 pack of shop towels and, you know, a couple of jugs of glycerin. And I'm still buying all legal product, you know. I'm just perhaps tearing the label off of something else and putting it on the glycerin jar while I'm doing it. But, you know, I'm, I'm trying to stay legal. The FDA and the EPA and the USDA, they just can't keep up with us. So. <laughs> anyway, um, when you're doing these treatments, is just something that takes a, a little time to, timing, right? You gotta figure out when you can get your treatments in. I found one of the most critical things to do is getting those treatments in before your winter bees. This, if you haven't treated for mites yet, you're kind of already too late. We look at September 1 as our latest cutoff period to treat for those mites because you want those bees going into winter to be as healthy as possible. You know that the queen reduces her egg laying in most of y'all's high. We push ours you know, keep her building all through the end of January because we put them on a truck to go to almonds and those hives have to be packed with bees, you know. So we push ours like athletes all the time. You may say, all right, I'm putting your fun on candy board or whatever, you know, you got your six frames of honey in there at least. But the bees themselves have to be healthy to get it through to February. It's one of the most challenging times that they have. If they're not healthy going in, I guarantee you they would be dead coming out. Those mites will just sit there and feed, 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 mm. phoretically on those bees that you have left. Have you all used oxalic acid before? Mm -hmm. What do you? What results are you getting? Are you vaporizing or dribbling? Vaporizing. 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 vaporizing? Is there any reason why those of you who haven't, haven't? Does that make sense? For those of you who have not used oxalic acid, is there a reason why you haven't? I'm sorry? I said it's not That's a good reason. Okay. Well, that's a good reason. I just heard about it on Thursday. I used paper bars in September, August, September. Good timing. Yeah. But that's just a rock screen. No reason why you have to move to solid boards. I would suggest dribble. I would suggest dribbling. Um, I'm not saying anything against the guys that, that vaporize. Um, there's a 2% difference, scientifically proven, a 1 to 2% difference in the efficacy between vaporizing and dribbling. I do, however, believe that breathing, if you're not going to wear a respirator, which for some reason a lot of beekeepers just don't, yeah, it's safe to stick it in. Do you wear a vaporizer when you use it? I'm talking about the, I'm talking about fuzzy man next to you. Actually, my brother does it. Oh, throw him to the dogs. <laughs> Well, it's harder, it's harder for us, you know, that, to get that seal that you need. Uh, it's no shave November, by the way. That's the only time I grow a beard. But come February, it's gone. But it's hard to wear a, a respirator when you have a beard. So that's why I shaved. For for a one to two percent efficacy, I'd say it's much safer to dribble it. Okay. And, and then, then you can get all strung out on glycerin and shop towels later on. I'm making a note of the shop towels. I think it's faster, <laughs> too, really, because you don't have to wait for the vaporizer to warm up. Correct. And there's less things to monkey with. We, we have a, a video on our website. You can go look at it, and it's how we do the dribble method. Because I know people say, you know, here, dribble it. But if you've never used a, a 5 ml syringe before, you know, it might, well, 
how's he doing that, look at our video and then get, you can get those syringes on Amazon and fill it with water and just practice. It, it is incredibly fast in, in how it's applied. Did you say five or 50? Sorry, 50. I use, I use a garden sprayer. Because we, we run A-frame double deep hives. Ooh, commercial guy runs A-frame? Yeah, it's possible and it works. How do you all run 10 frame hives? Why? Because uh, that's what you were told? <laughs> that's how I started and I've got too much invested already. And that's how most commercial beekeepers today are 10 frame highs for that reason. They're generational and that's what they have and it's too expensive to replace. Go back to the beginning when I said think about where you want to be. There are more. When I first started, eight frame was just starting to come out. And I looked in the mirror and went, 50. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd have done that. Now, 80 to 100 pounds a box, that's pretty heavy stuff. I run eight frame hives for one reason and one reason only. I'm too gray to be left in 100 pound boxes all day long. And we, we run eight frame hives commercially, pollination work just fine. So, anyway, so I would suggest that you can use oxalic acid. Very safe product to use. Going back to your question about summer splits, these are your potential killers. You split those hives right after that main flow. The good thing is, that usually there is enough honey in the box so when you do your splits in the summer you have good brood right you know as said it's a time it's all about timing if you wait too long that brood population goes down because the honey flows over there's not much pollen left over so the queen has stopped laying if you wait to that point it's getting kind of late you can still do your splits but they're not obviously going to be as strong you get it right after that last one. But eventually, your resources outside, depending on where you live, are going to dry up. So we don't recommend it to those first time beekeepers because most of them, you know, remember the spring splits allow you to make all kinds of mistakes. <coughs> You're not monitoring your hives, feeding your hives the pollen sub and the syrup that it needs after those summer splits they're not going to make it. So you were saying that you see uh, your splits increase in population. You got them up to two double uh, Already, double yeah. Deeps yeah, because I, I feed them the protein sub and the syrup. And luckily for me, <coughs> where I have this magic bush called bee brush, and all it takes is one flow of that bee brush, which happened after our splits, and I'll get another two to three frames of honey in the hive and the queen all of a sudden goes into euphoria and will go into a, a mass brood production. I also did two other things this year. I participated in a trial for this, you know, there's a lot of feel good stuff to make the bees healthy and all that. Well, I participated in this trial for, for a certain product to see whether or not, you know, would have an impact on my hives. Well, what better time to do that than other than summer splits? Because you know you, you got to do everything you can. To, I was quite amazed at how that product worked and the amount of brood that came after feeding that into the syrup. I was like, well, there might be some to this stuff. What? I use Ultra B, and uh, the way I mix the powder, we have a big. Uh, Paddle mixer, it's a not a cement mixer, mortar. It's a mortar stucco mixer, and uh, we mix it with really heavy syrup. So we mix two bags of powder to five bags of sugar. We put the sugar in first, eight and a half gallons of water to five bags of sugar. It's thick syrup, but we want those bees to eat that patty fast. That's a trick I learned from Chris about doubling the sugar that it tells you to put in. We also add 
corn oil and canola oil to it because I want fat, get more fat into those bees. But that's the only two things that we mix besides the Ultra B. Mixes up in the big mixer and we put it in meat lugs. And I mean, we don't put paper between it. We take a <coughs> drywall knife, a six inch drywall knife. We have the meat lug. You know, if you've ever gone to a butcher, you see those great <coughs> meat around it. Get a drywall knife full of it. And use a second drywall knife to cut it into like chicken strips, chicken fingers. It's about this wide. We don't lay it on as one big patty because we want more space between it so more bees can access it. It's also how you prevent a lot more of your moth and beetle. You know, when you got one big flat patty, you, bees can only get to it you know, on the edges. We cut it into those chicken fingers and now you have more space around the patty and more bees can eat it at the same time. And we lay it right, you know, smoke your fingers, get the bees right. down. And we lay it right in there and put the second box back on. So you have to touch the, like on top of the frame board? On top of the frames. In between the boxes. Across, uh, across the frame. You're running across the frame or with the frame? Well, your frames run this way in the box. We're chicken fingering it this way. Okay. What kind of oil do you say you have? Canola oil and corn oil. And that two bags to five bags, it's uh, 96 ounces of corn oil, 96 ounces of canola oil. They're chubby bees. <laughs> and the nice thing too is it helps it kind of not stick to everything. Because when you get that right consistency of that patty mixer, it's like, it's not as stiff as cookie dough, it's not as runny as cake batter. It's somewhere in between, and it just don't get it on your hands because it's you know not comfortable. <coughs> swipe. Is there a different period of the year when you would do the the wet patties versus feeding dry pollen, or do you just always go with wet patties? I go with wet patty because I all of my hives are out on ranches, mm -hmm. so anything outside the hive just attracts a little bit for me. Now, if, if I were, you know, I would used to run exotic animals and when I would fill my protein feeders, this is before I you know, before when I was eating like maybe one jar of honey in a year and knew nothing about bees. I always wonder why all these bees would swarm around the top of the feeder while, you know, this feed dust was going up in the air. Well there was molasses and protein obviously in the feed so the molasses smell attracts them and, and I just thought that was so fascinating. Maybe it was a precursor of destiny or fate, mm -hmm. whatever. But I never got stung. Mm -hmm. I just sit there and watch them and like, when are they not going to be able to fly? Because they're so covered in this dust. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the coons and foxes and everything else, we find all kinds of squirrels, create all kinds of ways to get into it. But you don't find that there's like certain times of the year where they don't want the wet patties at all or that they yes. would rather have dry? There are times that they don't want the patty, and that's when there's lots of pollen available to them. So going back to knowing what's going on in your hives every seven to ten days, you can see the you know, right now we're getting tons of ragweed pollen. You know, we were feeding in July and August and part of September till we got some rains, and the next thing you know, the ragweed's going crazy, so we stopped feeding patty. We kept feeding syrup because there's nothing nectar-wise out there. But if I fed patty, I'll we'll just leave it. Until the box gets so full, like you have a double deep high full of bees, they'll eat it regardless. Because the field force is using it as energy to continue to go get more. Now you have so many mouths to feed that you want that pollen that they're bringing in for brood production. And they'll store that pollen. They won't store the patty. They'll either not eat it or eat it. They won't store it. So in part two, we're gonna talk about how we start coordinating the timing of, of doing some pollination work 
what the impact of adding queen production to that would be. And of course we already did honey and splits, but now how does honey, splits, and pollination all work together? And this is a pollination where you gotta think about putting 400 hives onto a truck and putting them to California. This is pollination work that you can do right around where you live. Whether it's with small farmers or, or larger farmers, you can do it very easily. I'm going to talk to you about B yard or out yard rentals because some of you, some of you, when you start getting too many hives in one spot, it's not good for your bees because you know although they'll fly for three miles, I live in a county where it can rain in one corner of the county and not the other. I had a ranch where it would rain out in my third pasture and not rain at my barn. You know, I mean, it's just crazy to think of those kind of differences. So I spread my bees out all throughout San Salvador County, which means I gotta have some kind of an arrangement with landowners. We're gonna talk about that. And also pollination contracts that I've used with local farmers. And if you stay all the way to the end of that one, you'll see an email address that you can send me and I will send you these contracts in Word format so you know you can change the name and the conditions, etc. My rental agreement is simple because most most ranchers, old school, it's usually just a handshake and that's all it takes. Things are a little different now with people and sometimes it's better just to have an agreement. Now some of my ranchers, especially the really old ones, they look me in the eye, they shake my hand, and they don't do anything with that piece of paper. <laughs> because that's all that matters to them. But some of the younger ones, I get the piece of paper or I don't put the bees on the land. The farmer, uh, the grower contract I have is one that I use for watermelons out in West Texas. It's like a six page contract. Those guys were quite surprised when they saw that. But it protects them and it protects me. And I think you, you even if you're gonna go out and do a, a 20 acre melon patch or something for your local farmer, it's always good to have. It. Let's just make an understanding. Because you don't ever want to get to a legal bind if you don't have to. Have you ever had to retrieve your property? Retrieve my property? No, not voluntarily. Uh, I've had to move some bee yards. You know, in that, in that uh, agreement, the landowner can ask me to leave, but I have a certain period of time to do that. I had one landowner in San Saba that asked me to relocate my bee yard. I had four on his various different properties because the pipeline, natural gas pipeline was going through and the contractor ahead of the pipeline in that area wanted that particular piece of land to set up all of his office trailers and stuff. So I moved that beer. But I did it according to the agreement. It wasn't because they did something wrong. I take that back. In 2013, I, I removed bees from a beer because I found out that the people had a, a pea torture on that branch. <coughs> And although they said they weren't spraying, I know for a fact, based on the number of dead bees I had out in front of hives that had their proboscis sticking out, which by the way is a, one of the first indicators of pesticide poisoning, look for that dead bee belly up proboscis sticking out. I know for a fact that they were spraying. Unfortunately, in that case, I don't think they have friends here. <laughs> He worked for the police station. She was a teacher at the local school who taught my daughters. I just happened to find another bee yard that they would be happier in. <laughs> some, sometimes you have to know when to press the button and when to leave it alone. Any questions on part one? Am I, how am I doing on time? <laughs> 30 minutes to finish. I'm 30 minutes behind?
Okay, well, I have mean, seen a whole lot of new people in, so the good news is I can really go far yeah. too. That's supposed to be up over there. It must be the different. Uh, we went through this. Let's stop there and enjoy that for just a moment. I, I, I really want to, to say that it doesn't matter if you're one, two, or five, you can still do a lot of this stuff. It's just the, the, the level to which you do it at this stage gives you the practice that you need for when you really get strung out and you're at 25 or 30 or 50 highs. You've had enough practice to get to get to them at that level. <coughs> you can do all of this. You can. Depending on how good you are at logistics and how good you are at planning and executing that plan way before those critical points in time become in front of you. Okay, if you're going to pollinate, okay, start thinking about some of the crops that you have right around your area. I had no idea what vetch was. And all, you know, I'm sitting there talking to Casey you know, up at Data, and he says, yeah, I like order on vetch. And I'm like, vetch. <laughs> Huh? Vetch. It's a vetch. Yeah. It's like hen bit. You memorize, Tanya? Yeah, there's some all over the place. It's a weed. Yeah. So, not, not so much cotton anymore, but, you know, Chris went through some challenges. Chris Moore went through some challenges because he went to sell some of his honey and Somebody said, oh, there isn't any sesame in Texas. Well, you know, he saw this. Well, yes, there is sesame in Texas. You know, you got all these commercial beekeepers going to North Dakota for canola. Mm -hmm. You know, they grow a lot of canola right here in Texas. Mm -hmm. I know where there's a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> Watermelons, a lot of melons out in West Texas. There's a lot of watermelon growing right in our community. And what are those orange ones? <laughs> be careful on melons. Be prepared if you do melons to feed your bees because uh, your bees will starve on melon pollination. Uh, you still can make it worthwhile to yourself. We're, we did uh, what started out to be one farmer in West Texas turned out to be three farmers in 160 hives you know, out in Garden City but we charged $85 a hive because I know I had to drive three hours mm -hmm. to get out there. I was going to have to feed at least once or twice, three times while those hives were there. So the labor, the time, the fuel, you have to take into consideration what those are and you still have to think about what am I losing by giving up those hives to go to pollination. Now in my particular case, as it always happens to be. We took two truckloads of bees. I only have a 16 foot 5500. The last truckload is on the way. I get home and it rained for three days. <coughs> what happens to the bee brush after it rains? <coughs> All the 160 hives that I took out there, not collecting honey. So that was kind of a bummer. but. Remember I told you, I, did, I just need more bees so I can have them anywhere I want them when I need to be there. But you can make some decent money, you know, pollinating hives. And if you want to get involved, I didn't call these farmers. Somehow they found out about me because I talked to a few people in the ag community. Your ag extension agents can be your best friends. Give a jar of honey to your ag extension agent every once in a while. Because these farmers call these ag extension agents and say, do you know somebody that can do X? That's how these guys found us. I'm finding out that other people that have found us to use for pollination contacted different ag agents who somehow got back to me. So think about that. If you have, I have one guy that we kept bees on his property Little do I know that when I talked to him about putting bees there, because I liked the location because of the bee brush and the persimmon and some of the other plants, 
He had a three and a half acre homestead farm that I hadn't even seen on that land. And I hadn't been charging him. I gave him a gallon of honey to put my bees on his property <laughs> as part of our rental agreement. And yet he's getting the benefit of pollination. <laughs> we got some melons and some blackberries and some other stuff in exchange for that gallon of honey once I found out that was going on. But those farmers exist, small community farmers exist, and you can help them out and at the same time. Hopefully, you're looking at, at the best pollination crop you can get is one that you don't have to feed your bees on. Okay? And if you get some of the smaller farmers, they're less apt to use in money chemicals as some of the bigger ag, ag farmers will. So <coughs> consider the balance. Talk to your farmers. Communication is the most important thing that you can do, especially when it comes to spraying. And if you, if you see the last slide, do what you need to do to get the contracts, read them, especially about the spraying and what happens if you kill a hive, what happens if you need me to move hives, that kind of stuff. You, you also have to look at the fact that pollination is a substitute in income for honey in bad years. If I wouldn't have pollinated last year, I probably would have made a lot more honey, but honey in my honey production in my area is a roll of dice. It all depends on how much rain we get. And I've lived in that community for 13 years now, and 2014 was a bang up year for rain. 15 was horrible, 16 was okay, 17 was okay. What's 18 gonna be? I don't know. So when I get opportunities to do some pollination, I have to look at what's the revenue trade-off versus the honey production that I'm gonna give up for that number of hives. I'd like to have hives here, but not all my hives here for honey. I like to have hives here for pollination, but not all. How do I start allocating hives? And these, as you look at splits, queen production, pollination, honey production, what's the best allocation of your hives in each one of those areas to balance where you're not hurting one to do the other? Last year, I, I kind of got stuck on that. So you don't actually get the harvest the honey when you pollinate? What's, that was a dumb question. On melons, no. Okay. On vetch, yes. On sesame, yes. On canola, most of the time. If you're if you're going to North Dakota, it's a crapshoot, you know, based on what the weather's doing here. In Texas, what was the winter like? How much rain did they get in the fall will determine how much honey you'll get from canola. I plan on two boxes of hive. My bees built up beautifully on the canola, didn't produce a drop of honey. Bummer. But luckily it was all within an hour away, so I didn't spend a lot of money putting my hives there. Although I didn't get any honey off of it, my hives built up beautifully on that pollen. But they didn't get the rain in the fall that we needed to. I haven't given up on them yet, so we'll see. If you're going to start thinking about large-scale pollination, think about big trucks and forklifts. And remember what I said, once you get a forklift and a big truck, you can do just about anything, and it makes it real easy to do. Not everybody has or wants to do that, but you can do a lot of pollination work <coughs> on a simple 12-foot trailer or a 10-foot trailer. You don't even need a pickup truck to pull it. You, you know, you pull a little trailer like that and you can put 10 hives on it just with your regular car. You just need a trailer edge. So if your bees are sitting somewhere where you're having to feed them, why not go find some place to pollinate and get it on a, on a honey producing pollination crop where they can get both pollen and nectar out of it. And then you don't have to feed them because you were hoarding them in your backyard where everything else wasn't producing, it wasn't much putting them in. If you don't necessarily want to be involved in the pollination effort and work, maybe you can find other beekeepers that you can put your hives onto their pollination contracts. 
Now, it should be an even split, right? Or a proportional split. If I'm taking 100 hives out to California, I need 300 more to fill a truck. <coughs> Let's say I'm taking a truck because I send a truck. Now I only got half as many as I need to fill a second truck. I'll go to other beekeepers and say, hey, I got a half a truck that I need to fill in order to make it cost effective. Do you want to you want to go out to California? Here is my contract with the broker. You will get a proportion of everything that I get. Now there might be a small fee for loading your hives, you know, onto the truck and off the truck when they get back, but it's certainly not huge. But anything <coughs> that I get, you get in proportion. Any expense that I have, you get in proportion. That's the kind of arrangement that you have to be looking at. Okay? As honest as as people can be, there's still, you know, shenanigans that people can pull up. The less educated you are, the more they can get away with. So educate yourself. This is a friend of mine, Eric Luber from Lieber Honey. This is how he pollinates, and he does co uh, cotton and vetch this way. He can get 30 hives on this trailer and this weird extension thingy. It's actually, he's got two uh, hives on both sides of the trailer, and then this rampy thingy comes out of the middle of the trailer once he gets to the location. And he's got it on a, on a winch on his truck that he pulls it back in. But, uh, you know, I think that's a 16-foot trailer. Well, this, it, it folds back up into the middle of the deck. So picture that there's hives on each side of the deck, and then the green thing goes back up into the middle. It's already in its extended position. But he, he now has multiple of these trailers, and he just leaves the hives on the trailer. He's got, you can see the, the black straps. All of the hives are strapped to the deck when he's moving. He just unstraps them when he gets there to work the bees. But this works out very well, and the capital investment is pretty small. So these I, are all single hives with supers on? They're not hives stacked on top of hives, are they? No, they're all individual hives, <coughs> all on the edge with super stacked. Now, what's he got into that trailer? 12, 1300 bucks for a 16 foot utility trailer? I have one for sale if anyone wants to buy it. <laughs> I have a tilt deck trailer now that I use for my forklift, so, um, but I have a trailer just like that. <laughs> but for 12 or 13, I think that's what they cost, you know, right around there. I mean, you can get into pollination services pretty easily. Yeah, like all things, you know. There's risk and risk reward associated with doing it. And knowing who your farmer is and what their farming practices are could be okay or not okay for you. But as long as you and the farmer, the grower, he needs you and he needs your bees. You know, these guys that call me for watermelons, they needed me. I needed them. And as long as we can come to a mutual arrangement that worked for both of us, I was willing to roll the dice, and I'm glad I did. Now, unfortunately, I think instead of three farmers, it's going to be five farmers next year, or six farmers, because once you, I'm, I'm about establishing relationships, and once you establish a relationship, and you nurture and keep that relationship alive, and it continues to work for both of you, both of you are going to do things that benefits the other. I mean, isn't that what a relationship's all about? Got me married for 30 years, you know, you do everything you can to make her happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's what's the she's like kept her? me happy too. I'm sorry. For the farmer, are they, you know, without pollination, are they getting no yield? Or are they with pollination, are they doubling it? Or are they getting 30%? What's their dynamic? In the case of almond crops, without pollinators, they don't set a crop. No okay. Now with watermelons, if you've ever been out to uh, Midland or Garden City, there is nothing out there but dirt and wind turbines and pump jacks, okay? So they don't have a native bee population to pollinate the number of watermelons 
So they have they have had to call and find beekeepers over the years. And unfortunately, you know, I, of course, I ask those questions: Who did you use before? Why aren't you using them anymore? And it's you know usually because the guy's dead, or he's out of the business, or you know some other. And I check up because I know I don't want to be the next victim of bad farming practices. So I yeah okay that guy is dead. <laughs> <laughs> so we just screwed all the other guys. And you're, you're next. Yeah, and I don't want I don't want to be that guy, right? And you never want to be that person that gets taken advantage of. And unfortunately, you know there are some unscrupulous people out there. But these three guys that I worked with, they were all fantastic, and we communicated. In fact, it got a little tiring, you know. The, the one farmer kept calling me almost every night, giving me a status report of how many bees he saw flying out of my eyes. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Four. <sighs> you know how many he saw, but I, I think he's just lonely. All <laughs> right. You know. He's calling you because he's excited. Yeah. You know, and I. Okay, it's ten. I really want to go to bed. You know, nurturing the relationship. Once you know the crop and how it works with the bees, there's still risk that the area might be harsh or the bees just might not like it and leave. Yeah, the one thing that made me really nervous is that a lot of these uh, watermelon patches were around pump jacks that had the big, you know, overflow. And, it, you know, where's the water source? <laughs> so, a lot of these guys set up watering stations for my bees. Mm -hmm. So I was very, very happy about that. And I, when I went out there every every ten days or so, I made sure that the floats were working and everything. Yeah, I see my bees around it. So yeah, yeah. It is a time to manage risk, and as much as you want to feel good about people that you work with and shake hands, like some of the the older patriarchs in, in our area. Contracts are important, especially when you're talking about a large volume of hives in an area of the state that you've not been to before, uh, and you can manage those risks through those contracts. So let's let's talk about some of the timelines and strategy. We all know that bees build up February, March, April, May, right? Most bees don't build up August, September, October, November, December. We're used to seeing them build up, and then they kind of go down, right? Start thinking <coughs> about keeping your bees built up August, September, October, November. You want your bees going into winter as strong as you possibly can get them. Now people say, well, what if then I got too many bees and they eat all the resources? If you have six frames in an eight frame hive, or call it six frames or seven frames in a 10 frame hive, double deep hive. In the last six years, I've not seen any of my hives consume every one of those frames of honey ever. In some cases, I've only consumed half. What you have to be careful of is February. Because you get a couple of those warm days and the queen starts producing or you're pushing her to continue producing, and all of a sudden you you don't have the flows that you're expecting in March or April, that's when you gotta see those, watch those resources, February. I would suggest you keep building those hives all the way through. Most of your pollination contracts are gonna be February through June, so obviously you want those hives built up I don't know if I have to do this laser. You right into this period for pollination contracts, I guarantee a minimum to my melon growers, <coughs> frames, they have the right to inspect them. So I've got to keep my hives built here to satisfy almonds and melons. But I also want my hives built up so I can produce honey. But as you can see, there's this gap that nothing's happening in June, July, and here. So we talked about doing those splits. Why not bust them down at that point in time, as long as I can continue to build them up. 
now you just got into the honey business, you just got into the pollination business, you did your splits, you got better queens in the summer to do your splits, and you didn't lose anything on the honey side either. This was so counterintuitive to what most all of the books told you to do as a small scale beekeeper. I do this, it works. And it took me a couple of years to figure this out. You know, by splitting hives in the spring, getting crappy queens, gee, why can't I produce as much honey as I want to produce? And then just through talking to other people, they say, well, why don't you do this? I'm like, ooh, that's not what the book says. <laughs> so I'm sharing it. Now, if you add queen production in there, you've got to take into consideration that most of those here, March, April, and May, is going to be the best time for you to do that here in Texas. And I know the queen breeders here in Texas. I don't buy Texas queens. I buy all my queens from Northern California where they don't have Africanized bees. Why? Because all the queens that I was buying here from two of the most popular queen breeders, half of them, if not more, were the nastiest things I ever worked with. Most days I don't even use a smoker. You know, I'm not that Randy Oliver who'll sit there in his t-shirt and no bail or anything because all hives have a bad day occasionally. You just don't know which one it's going to be. <laughs> or the skunk was, you know, at the hive, beat it up last night. You know, all the hives in the yard were great to get the one that the skunk, skunk visited and just scratch it out on light and then take the one off and she blows up. So at that point, when you start doing this many things, you have to be cognizant of the fact that if you're going to do pollination work, it's going to take a minimum number of eyes for a farmer to be interested in you. If you're going to produce some honey, if you're going to sell any, you're going to need to produce a certain amount of honey to make it worthwhile to put it in a jar and market it and sell it. The stuff that you're doing here uh, is the uh, uh, requirements for minimum uh, numbers of bees about the same as California, or is it less, or what's it? I set that with the farmers. You know, what are they looking if, for? If, if I would have told, they just want good bees. What does that mean? I, I don't know. So I went with what I knew and said, I'm going to give you a minimum of eight frames of bees. I took double deeps out to them. And I said, you have the right to inspect my hives anytime you want. If any one of them drops below an eight frame minimum average, I'm going to make up for that and replace that hive. That's part of my contract. Now, if you're a farmer, what does that make you feel? Well, good. good, right? But I'm charging them 85 bucks a hive to do it. Should have been 90? I don't know. What's the going rate? About 65 to 70 bucks. Depends on what part you Now, if I was pollinating a guy in the next county, would I charge him 85? No. Probably not. But he knew he was three hours away from me and I was going to have costs. And I told him, I'm going to have to feed because I'm not going to get anything off your water. And so that's why I'm saying understand the crop and price accordingly. There are uh, national pricing guidelines for different areas. I've seen watermelons as low as 40 bucks. If they were in my backyard, you know, literally one ranch over, I'd probably charge them 40 bucks because it's not a lot of effort for me to go there versus loading the trucks from a trip three, mile, three hours away. <coughs> this is what I came down to. I just need more bees. So I, <laughs> this is what our bees look like. Uh, this was uh, spring, not this year, spring, or I'm sorry, summer splits 2016. And I remember it because it was cloudy. It was really <coughs> rainy. I never got stung so many times in my life. You know, like 200 a day. By the third day of doing splits, I was so done and over with it. But my legs felt great for about a month. You know, I, I only wear a jacket and a hood, so I take it in the legs. But, you know, because you're wet, the kid's right to you. They were not happy with this. But as, as, 
is you'll find when you get to a certain number, of high, you have to do things when you have to do it. You know, you, you'd probably wait a week and everything would be okay, which I wish I could have. But I had a bank of queens that I had to get taken care of. But anyway, this, this is what our hives look like after that just finished honey production. Now, in, in my area, that white brush, white brush, bee brush, will bloom every 10 days after it rains. But I have found, understanding my ecological environment in the last 12 years of living there, how much flow did I get to make a crop after June? It's a crap shoot every year. Sometimes I might produce just enough to keep <coughs> it in the hive. Sometimes I produce a third of my main honey crop. But I know anything that I get after June is a blessing. So most of my honey is produced by June, and that's what my hives look like. They're <coughs> right for spring at that point in time. Lots of brood, lots of bees. The best of both worlds. Any questions? Yeah. I'm not there yet. I'll get to you. Sorry, I had two more slides. So I talked to you about the Bee Yard Agreement. I call it an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding. It's a simple two-page agreement, but there are some critical things for you to make sure that you have 24-7 access to the property, okay? I move bees in the middle of the night. A couple of ranchers I call and I say, I'm coming tonight. Don't shoot me. <laughs> Seriously, I still call, and I'm, I've had these yards several years, and I still call. I'm coming tonight. Don't shoot me. I give a gallon of honey for for the space to put my bees. Now, I had one guy that said, well, I get half your honey. I said, I have more yards I can go visit. You get a gallon. I want half your honey. I said, see it. Mm -hmm. I had another guy that says, I want 10%. I said, do you want 10% of my expenses? I'll take a gallon. Mm -hmm. And I had other people that said, you don't have to give me anything. And I say, I give you a gallon because that's what I give to everyone. And most people, they'll take their gallon and they'll buy two or three cases of honey to give away as Christmas gifts because I strategically deliver it in September. <laughs> so I'm fresh in their mind, they've had time to eat the gallon, and then they're in their Thanksgiving time frame of, I gotta get, oh yeah. So a lot of extra money that way. <laughs> we talked about why having the, uh, one of the things I didn't talk about was theft. You know, bee theft is something that's very prevalent today. You know, especially you hear more about it in Auburn, you hear more about it in places in Texas. If you're taking your bee somewhere, you don't know the area, you don't know the people that well, Texas Insurance will insure your hives. They will not insure the bees themselves, okay? But if you, you can insure the box, the base, the pallet, the frame, everything. Let me make a suggestion to you. What does a frame cost? Well, if you buy about a thousand, it cost me 80 cents. A sheet of wax, because I use wax wired foundation. So let's say you have a buck and a half in the frame, okay? Because you got labor to put it together and all that. Why would you insure your frame <coughs> for a buck and a half after it's been drawn out? How many resources did it take to take that frame from a frame of foundation to comb. A lot. I insure every drawn frame at $25. <laughs> because that's what it's worth to me to have to replace it and go back to stick and wax. Okay? A lot of people have gotten burned that way. Because, you know, frames are cheap, right? Not once it's drawn out. And the insurance, the way they do it, is it's for a year and it's X amount of dollars per thousand or X amount of dollars per hundred in value. So to insure 
my bees to go out to California, it's about $2,000, right? What's 400 double deep hives worth with fully drawn out frames? Is it a green value? I'm sorry? Is it a green value? I still didn't hear you. Is it a green value? Agreed value. Agreed value. It's what I say the value is. is so, it, okay, that's a value. Yeah. Okay. And if they're willing to insure it for X amount of work, I say I got X number of boxes, X number of comb. I would insure your bees if you're going to take them to a place that you might not be comfortable with. The long term expense isn't that much when you factor in what, it could, what you could lose. I climb a radio town and people are like, yeah, but that equipment is so expensive, so what's falling off for? <laughs> <laughs> All right, as, as I stated, if you would like to get copies of these contracts, send me an email. You will get it faster if you give us a like on Facebook, too. <laughs> you like it? What if you already liked it? Then it comes overnight. <laughs> no, I'll send it to you via email. I will send it to you in Word. Uh, I'll have things that'll be already, you know, like fill in the blank, you know, for the dollar amount and stuff like that. And obviously, I have to take people's names out. But you'll in the, the pollination contract. If you're used to reading contracts and you're okay with it. Great. If not, send it to your attorney and let him look at it. I <coughs> welcome you to do that. I'm not saying use it carte blanche and if there's a problem and you get sued or you want to sue somebody else. Well, that's the contract Headley gave me. <laughs> <laughs> I take no liability, <laughs> sure. etc. You know, all of the standard limitations of liability apply. And you're in these, you're, I'm giving them to you to help you. you know, if, if they can be useful to you. Use them if you want. Take parts of them, cut other parts off, do whatever you want. I found that they have been very helpful to me, and I just want to share it with you. Any questions? Did I go over? Am I on? Uh, right on time. Wow. Look at that. Crazy. Are you still using the uh, polymerized house? Yes. Okay. Except in 2015. We didn't get rain for six months. I was losing hives like flies, even though, remember I was saying, they'll build on pollen sub, and after a while, if you feed it to them for nine months, they just said, hives. So I took all of my polymerized hives and turned them into production hives to save my hive in 2016. So I just sold our ranch. We're in a new building now. I'm buying loads of bees, so we'll repopulate all of our polymerized hives, and I'll have more hives for pollination, more hives for honey production. It's like, so you still believe when it comes? Oh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. It's just unfortunate that I. It's fortunate that I did it and had it because that's what saved me. Right. But now I owe it to put it back. <coughs> um, so obviously you had a ranch. I'm, I'm curious if you know if you if you were small or non-existent, and you wanted to expand. Does the bee yard thing make more sense now than tying the capital and land? Sure. <coughs> or do you require land? Is that just a given? It doesn't make sense unless you. I went from 500 acres to 22 yeah. as we're empty nesters now, and we're no longer in the exotic wildlife business. We're in the bee business. That was a weird transition, but I keep bees on everybody else's land. Perfect. So if you if you live in a suburb of Dallas and you know lots of people out in the country, stay in the suburb of Dallas to keep all your bees out in the country. There you go. I don't own any property. I don't have a wall on people's property. I live in Dallas. That's great. What do you do for winter? What do you do for winter in yards though? I'm sorry. Okay. What do you do for your wintering yards? My existing yards are my wintering you just yards. Keep them out. When when we bring them back in January, we change to different pallets. I use different pallets for ranches than I do for almond pollination. Uh -huh. I have to have straps and ratchets on the hives when they're because the ranch rows are horrible, so they 
just accumulate all over the truck. And plus, we have raccoons that are notorious of ripping lids off and ripping frames to eat brood. The skunks just scratch at the entrance. The raccoons will rip the lids off. So we use different pounds. In January, we bring them back to our holding site where our operation <coughs> is. We have those uh, cart dollies like you see in the Man Lake catalog that make it real easy to pick up a hive and move it to a different pallet. So we have one person on the forklift, two people on trolley carts moving hives. We can do 150 hives in a, in a very relaxed, cold day. And then so for splitting then, you're doing the same same deal. You bring them all back from Palmen, or you're doing it in the summer, so I'm sorry. So you bring them all back and split? It will we'll pull, you know, those extra frames and those huge hives that look like they're gonna blow. You know, you can create nukes out of there and it's it's what it's not doing splits, it's creating a nuke. But in July or in June, July we split everything. And they, they all come back for that to your to the holding, like that one picture I showed you. We bring them back in groups. Okay. Um, because the because basically whatever you bring back, we're doubling. So I, I just don't have enough room to do them all. Nor in the process of the way we have to do it, I can't do it fast enough and complete the process and still have that many hives. Now all of a sudden I have small hives, nukes, with production hives close by. Yeah, not good. You don't want to do that. So I, I bring back what I have, I split them, they're, and they're always all the same size. They're all big, but they're not all, all splits. So nobody's fighting with each other. Right. But the way we do those splits, have you, all, have you ever been to Chris Moore's session about mixing everything together and stacking and then unstacking the queens all kill each other? Uh -huh. Yeah, that, that blows a lot of people's mind when they come and do splits with the like, select. So you, I mean, you're following his process? That's the way we do it. That's the way a lot of commercial beekeepers do it. Because if you're out looking for queens, you don't have that kind of time. Yeah, so when you when you do your splits, you equalize them, like you're talking about, stack them up and equalize them. I let the queens you know kill each other and let them do the work. She could be in any one of four boxes. Maybe out of that whole process, there, there might be five, to eight percent of the queens that survive, good for them. They right. deserve to stay. So then, when you put your new queen in, she potentially could be the one who got killed. Potentially, am I right? Well, we're going to check the hive before we put a queen in. You know, we don't queen it until four day, four days later. If we see eggs, we then can make the choice. Okay. Keep the queen or kill the queen, but everything else gets requeened. Yeah. So we requeen everything all at the same time. Remember I told you, we have to do and keep our hives as consistent as possible at all times versus, uh, when did I queen that or when did I requeen that here? From a mental faculty perspective, it's, it's good to, okay, I just treated everybody with mites. I just treated everybody for new queens. I just fed everybody syrup. So we try to keep all of our hives the same. And who you buy your queens from? Uh, Lassen Queen Bee Company up in California. They cater to guys like me. Because, yeah. You know, no. The, I don't think you can handle the order for 10,000 queens. No. <laughs> but when I order 600, he can handle that. But he doesn't want to handle, I need one or two queens. Right, right. So he's in that middle market. <coughs> At some point, I'll outgrow him, I hope. But he, he does a good job for us. I know that uh, Chris, when I went to that, uh, was suggesting four frames of brood in each one. The guy that produces queens for Remember, me, he's running <coughs> 10 frame hives. Right, and so on. But the guy that I'm buying queens and queen cells from is telling me, and that's why I'm going to ask you what you think, uh, that they'll more readily accept the queen with fewer, say three, than they will with four. He says it's a statistical big difference because when they have four, they're more likely to try and raise their own queen than if they only have three less resources, they're more likely to accept the queen. Is there anything to that? I don't know. I will tell you that when we create our splits, 
we do two plus. We'd love to do three, but sometimes we don't have the brood because we were late. So I'll try and push it with two, but make sure that they've got good mass of bees. And that's what part of that equalization process is and stacking them. Now the challenge is when you unstack them, those ones that still had those remaining queens will suck the bees out of the other hives. Mm. And they'll all go to that hive that's got the queen. So that's an easy way to also find them, you know, in the ones that survive. But I try not to do anything less than two. Ideally, we like to have three. I don't, I don't have a situation where I've ever done four. Because most of the time, I'm trying to make up numbers, you know, for losses. I don't need to interrupt, but we're about to do the raffle for the vacation. So we're going to buy a ticket. I want that cabin. <laughs>